if you read the introduction of the paper betting against the correlation, you have already a good view of what the paper is actually about. So one of the major stylized facts on the risk return relationship uh, is the observation that assets or the stocks with low risk have high alpha, which is the so-called low risk effect. Uh, the original paper that documents this effect is here from Black and his colleagues from 72. It's uh, so the theory behind is it, so the theory behind it is not a new finding, right? So the debate is uh, whether the low risk effect is driven by leverage constraints and risk should be measured using systematic risk or if the low risk effect is driven by behavioral effects and then risk should be measured using uh, idiosyncratic risk. So the objective of this study is to test these two theories. The systematic low risk effect is therefore based on a on rigorous economic theory and uh, according to the study uh, has survived more than 40 years of out of sample evidence. Yeah, so this is also something interesting because in the last lecture we discussed that most anomalies failed replication. But obviously uh, this anomaly or, or this cross-sectional a phenomenon has survived, obviously, more than 40 years out of sample evidence, according to their study. So the challenge with the existing academic literature is that it seeks to run a horse race between factors that are by construction highly correlated, because risky stocks are usually associated with other kinds of risks as well. Um, so the most powerful way, according to the study, to distinguish between these theories is to construct a new factor yeah, that captures one theory while at the same time being relatively unrelated to factors capturing the alternative theory. So in order to achieve this, they decompose the betting against the beta factor into two other factors, the betting against the correlation factor, the BAC, and the betting against the volatility factor, the BAV. So the BAC goes long stocks that have low correlation to the market and shorts those with high correlation, while aiming at matching the volatility of the stocks that are bought and sold. So in contrast, the betting against the volatility factor goes long and short based on volatility while seeking to match the correlation. So that's why they do this double sorting. Yeah. So you remember on the whiteboard, we discussed that they use quintiles. Yeah? That's the reason why they use double sorting. Yeah? So they try to keep the other dimension relatively constant by that. So to see that the betting against correlation is uh, relatively uncorrelated, un uh, so variable-based factors, uh, they note that the long and short side of the BAC uh, have similar average volatility, skewness, and max. So the expectation of their study comes here in this paragraph. So they argue that uh, stocks with lower market correlations have lower market beaters when holding volatility constant. The theory of leverage constraints implies that betting against the correlation has positive risk-adjusted returns, so positive alphas, exactly like the betting against the beta factor. So what's the result? It comes also in the same paragraph here. So they find that the betting against the correlation factor is about as profitable as the betting against the beta factor, and that the betting against the correlation factor has a highly significant capital as a pricing model alpha, so risk-adjusted return, as predicted by the theory of leverage constraints. So the finding basically indicates uh, that the theory of, of leverage, leverage constraints uh, is basically uh, the underlying driving force here. And it's clearly separate from the behavioral factors. Yeah. 
as they control for volatility. Then they do a whole bunch of robustness checks. So they argue here that the uh, betting against the correlation factor has a five factor alpha of 0.6% per month. Yeah. The annual alpha is then this guy times 12. So it's 7.2% in, in annual terms. T statistic of 5.3. Yeah, we know from statistics that the T statistic of one larger than 1.96 suggests significance on a 5% level. So obviously this uh, risk adjusted return uh, is highly significant. Yeah, and this obviously a um, um, robustness check. So as a robustness check, they regress the spread uh, between uh, low correlation and high correlation stocks uh, on the five factor model. Yeah, and the intercept term is then basically the 0.6% per month, yeah, which is the risk adjusted uh, return. So then turning to the behavioral theory, uh, they consider the factors that go long stocks with low max, uh, which is denoted here as L max strategy, or low idiosyncratic volatility, which they denote as I vol. And we discussed already on the whiteboard that the original paper or the paper that documented first this idiosyncratic volatility puzzle was the paper from Ang et al. Um, from 2006, published in the Journal of Finance. So because idiosyncratic volatility is already based on decomposing volatility into its systematic and idiosyncratic parts, they do not further decompose the uh, I vol factor. For the... Uh, LMAX, however, they um, again create a new factor that helps to differentiate between uh, these alternative hypotheses by removing the common component, which is the volatility. So we have seen on the whiteboard that they kept basically the volatility somewhat constant. So by basically breaking down it into five quintiles and then implementing this uh, uh, MAX strategy for each of these quintiles. Yeah, yeah, so they construct a scaled max, which they call S max factor, that goes long stocks that have a low max return divided by its ex ante volatility yeah, and short stocks with the opposite char characteristics. So they are short stocks that have a high max return divided by the ex ante volatility. Yeah, and this factor uh, should capture lottery demand in a way that is not mechanically related to volatility uh, as it is more purely about the shape of the return distribution. This is what they argue here. Yeah? So according to a behavioral theory, uh, these idiosyncratic risk factors should have a positive alpha as well. Yeah? And this is also something that they confirm in the data. Yeah? So then, as we already spoke about, so they want to substantiate the findings uh, in, in order to give them an economic, more economic perspective uh, to capture the idea underlying the, lot, the theory of leverage constraints. They consider uh, the margin depths held by customers at NYSE member organizations yeah, for the US, yeah, co considering uh, the US sample. Um, and they find that uh, BAB, as well as the betting against the correlation factor, are predicted by measures of leverage constraints. Yeah. On the other hand, they also, of course, want to substantiate uh, the, the findings concerning the lottery demand and the, the SMAX factor. So uh, to study the behavioral lottery demand more directly, they consider uh, two new measures of lottery demand, profits earned by casinos in the US and sales lotteries tickets in the UK. So considering uh, just the US sample, yeah, so they consider uh, profits earned by casinos. Yeah? So if the SMAX is related to lottery demand, then that there should be somehow a connection or a link between uh, casino profits and the, the, the SMAX factor or the LMAX factor, respectively. And what they argue then is that they find that there's a contemporaneous increase in casino profits uh, with 
uh, low returns to the LMAX strategy and idiosyncratic volatility, which may be consistent with theories of lottery demand. So this is basically a, a very creative idea that they uh, link their empirical findings here to some eco eco economic driving forces yeah, in order to give them more economic, to, to, to give here an economic perspective as well. So that's always important also for research. If you want to show that it's not purely data mining, you it, it's, it's important to somehow connect it to an economic fundamental or to an economic important variable. So in summary, so what they also write here next here is, uh, let's just go back, that uh, the betting against the beta factor and the betting against the correlation factor are robust for controlling for LMAX and eyeball in the US and globally as well. Yeah? And the SMAX is robust to controlling for BAB in the US but LMAX and idiosyncratic volatility have both insignificant alphas when controlling for BAB. So they do a whole bunch of robustness checks here yeah, in order to uh, make their results more appealing. Yeah. So in, in summary, to conclude, they find that betting against the beta and betting against the correlation factor are robust to controlling for a host of other factors, having survived significant out-of-sample evidence yeah, have lower turnover than many of the well-known idiosyncratic risk measures, and this making them more implementable and realistic, and uh, are supported by rigorous theory of leverage constraints with consistent evidence based on margin depth. So that's basically, uh, you, have, you have a good clue of the paper after just reading the introduction. Yeah? Let's now turn to table one. So in, in table one, they give us basically uh, an overview, a summary of statistics. So they basically have a whole bunch of countries here that they, con that they consider. And what you see here also from, from the table, yeah, the US, yeah, you have total number of stocks is 24,000, much, much larger compared to all other countries. Yeah? So the weight in the global portfolio from the US it's 38.9, much, much higher than for all the others. So that's also, uh, that shows you for why the US market is so important in finance. Yeah? So, and why most studies just consider the, the US market yeah, foremost. So it's, it's obvious from already from this table here. Yeah? So that the US is so important because not only because of the market capitalization, uh, they're also the, the most firms, obviously. And uh, the weight in the global portfolio is the largest. Moreover, the sample period starts in the year already from 1926. So we have almost 100 years of, of, of data. Whereas for the other country, countries, uh, the data av availability start, starts much later, what you see here. Yeah. Also important, uh, they argue here in this section two, data and methodology, stock return. Stock returns are from the union of the Center for Research and Security Prices, the CRISP data, database, yeah, tape, and the Express Feed global database. All returns are denoted in US dollars and do not include any currency hedging. So, so as, the as all returns are in US dollars, all excess returns are measured as excess returns above the U.S. treasury bill rate. So that's also important to know. Yeah? So they converted all returns in, in U.S. dollar. So constructing section 2.1, constructing the betting against the correlation and the betting against the volatility factors. Yeah? So they construct the betting against the correlation factors for each country uh, at the beginning of each month, stocks are ranked in an scanning order based on the estimate of volatility in the end of the previous month. So for our purposes, we uh, are mostly interested, of course, uh, in the US sample, okay? So they they argue here in section two, two one, yeah, they make it very uh, fancy looking so they, they describe how they compound these, these, these factors yeah? so to construct 
the BAC and the BAV factors. Yeah, they need to estimate beta correlation volatility for all the stocks. And we have this formula in an eight. The formula in, in equation eight is important, yeah, where the time series, where the estimated time series beta for stock I is equal with the correlation between stock I and the market, which is given by, by this term, times the idiosyncratic risk of stock I divided by the risk of the market. Yeah. So they argue that to estimate the correlation, uh, they're using a five-year rolling window of overlapping three-day log returns. Yeah, so they, they, they compound the three-day log returns over, over a five-year sample. And this is basically what they, what they use as input data for compounding the correlation. Yeah. And for the volatilities, they're using only a one-year rolling window of one-day log returns, so simple returns, not, three -day, not, uh, not cumulative three-day returns as they use for the correlation. Yeah. And here they argue also that they require at least 750 trading days of non-missing data to estimate the correlation and at, at least 120 trading days of non-missing return data to estimate the volatility. Yeah. Why they do that, I don't see any motivation here. Yeah. So who knows? In section 2.2, constructing the LMAX, SMAX, and the idiosyncratic volatility factors, say, they argue that the LMAX is long on stocks with low max and short stocks with high max, where max is the average of the five highest daily returns over the last month. Yeah. Portfolios are value weighted. Yeah. So every stock in the portfolio gets the weight corresponding to the market capitalization. Small, to small stocks get a lower weight than uh, big stocks. Uh, portfolios are evaluated, refreshed every calendar month. So it's a monthly rebalance strategy. So the, the L max is the average of low max and large cap and low max and small cap portfolio returns minus the average of the high max and large max cap and the high max and small cap portfolio returns. But this is basically for the global portfolio. Yeah? For the uh, US, we, see, we will see that the condition the max on the volatility quintiles. Yeah? They argue here as well that just as beta is the product of correlation and volatility, a stock can have a high max because of high volatility or high positive skewness. And to decompose these effects, they construct a scaled max, S max measure. And how do they do that? Well, they compute the average of the five highest daily returns over the last month divided by the stock's volatility, uh, estimated as described in, in section 2.1. Yeah. They then compute the S max factor exactly as uh, the L max factor, but uh, based on the scale max on, on the scale max characteristic instead of the standard max. Next, in section two three and two four, that's maybe not so important here. Section two in section three, however, it's entitled systematic risk betting against correlation volatility and beta. So in, in that section, they dissect the betting against the beta factor into a betting against the correlation factor and a betting against the volatility factor. So here they decompose this one factor from the 2014 paper into two other factors, yeah, the BAC and the BAV. So one component, they betting against the uh, volatility factor uh, is more closely linked to idiosyncratic volatility and max. And the other component, they're betting against the correlation factor um, with little um, relation to these alternative factors. Yeah? The BAV is pure volatility bet, whereas the BAC, the betting against the correlation, is a pure bet against systematic risk. So theory predicts, and that's now important, that both components of BAB 
which is the BAC and the BAV, should deliver positive alphas because BAC varies correlation, holding volatility constant, and BAV varies volatility, holding correlation constant. And this is basically achieved by using this double sort approach, right? So let's now turn our attention to the first, uh, to table two. So what do we learn from table two? The table is entitled correlation versus volatility, beta and risk adjusted returns. So what we see here is yeah, the table shows 25 portfolios of US stocks running from 29, 1929 to 2015. Yeah, so the table reports capital asset pricing model betas uh, in panel A, and then panel B reports the capital asset pricing model alpha, so the regression inter the estimates of the regression intercepts. So let's now have a look what's what's going on here. Yeah. So again, what we see here is uh, a sort. So they use all stocks of the stock universe and sort it conditional on the correlation into five groups from P1 is portfolio one. And here we have the stocks that have the lowest correlation. Yeah? Here we have the stocks that have the lowest correlation. Whereas in this group, group five, we have the stocks that have the highest correlation. Then for each group, they have a second sort based on volatility. Yeah. So P1, this group here, has stocks that have the lowest volatility. And P5, this group here, has, contains the stocks that have the highest volatility. P1 and P1, in both dimensions, this portfolio gives us the uh, cap M beta of stocks that have the lowest correlation in the sample and the lowest volatility. Okay, and now again, the, the correlation is, is based upon the measure by measuring the, uh, taking the, the, the three day cumulative returns and the, uh, co and using the correlation measure based upon the past 750 days, okay? Whereas the uh, volatility is based on a 120 day measure. So this portfolio here has a cap M beta, so a sensitivity against the market factor of 0 0.4. Yeah? Whereas the stocks that have the highest correlation and the lowest volatility have uh, on average a cap M beta of 0 0.9. So the average, so Long minus short, if we are implement a strategy that is uh, buying stocks that have a high beta yeah, and selling stocks that have a low beta, given we are in this uh, group of, of stocks that have a low volatility, so the, the beta is 0.4. And I think, that, and I think that's a typo. It should be 0.5, right? Because 0.9 minus 0.4 is, in my world, 0.5. Here it is 0.4. It's obviously a typo. But the T-statistic is at least significant on any level. Yeah? You see the T-statistic is 25.2, which indicates significance on any level. Because it's larger than 1.96, much, much larger than 1.96. So and in the same way, you can go through the table. Yeah? Here we see, for instance, for the um, stocks that have the uh, highest volatility, yeah? if we implement a trading strategy that is long, on high beta stocks and short on low beta stocks, uh, the beta is what would be obviously 1.6 minus 0.8, which gives us 0.8, uh, with a t statistic of 15.2. So, moreover, what we see here is an increase, a linear increase from 0.8. 0.4 until 0.8, yeah, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0.8. So there's obviously a high correlation between these two dimensions 
correlation and volatility, implying that high correlation stocks tend to have a high water volatility as well, right? So in the same way, where they um, where we here implement a trading strategy that is high on uh, that is basically long on on high beta stocks and short on low beta stocks, we can implement also a trading strategy in the portfolio of low correlation stocks. Yeah, we can implement a trading strategy that is that 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 buys. So given we have uh, stocks that have a low correlation, we can buy uh, buy stocks that have a high volatility and short stocks that have a low volatility okay or beta yeah so the beta would be then 0.4 of that portfolio and in the same way having here stocks that uh, that have a high correlation and stocks that have a high uh, cap m uh, yes, uh, high volatility that have a beta of 1.6 uh, and we can implement a trading strategy that buys stocks in this group and sells stocks that have a low volatility and a high correlation so the beta would be then the beta of that portfolio would be 0 0.7 yeah. and what we see here as well a positive increase a linear increase as we move from low correlation stocks to high correlation stocks the uh, zero cost the uh, beta of the zero cost strategy here would be, is linearly increasing in the correlation now in panel b we see the corresponding cap m alpha so again panel a reports the corresponding uh, betas of the strategies yeah? and here what we have here on the uh, the zero cost strategies we have the uh, reported betas of these corresponding st um, strategies and in panel b we have the corresponding alphas so the payoffs the risk adjusted payoffs so what we see here again we are we can make it a little bit it's maybe too small so again, we have here stocks that have a low correlation. We are in the first quintile. Stocks that have a low correlation and have a low volatility. Now, those stocks obviously produce a risk-adjusted alpha of 0.4% per month, whereas stocks that have a low vo past, uh, volatility and a, low, uh, and a high correlation generate a return a risk adjusted cap m alpha or risk adjusted return of 0.1% per month so if we implement a trading strategy that is that is buying this portfolio so high correlation and low vol and low volatility stocks and is selling low correlation and low volatility stocks this trading strategy would obviously generate an alpha of minus 0.3 and the statistic is significant yeah, minus uh, 3.7 is the corresponding value of the t statistic. So, and as we see here, in this group here, yeah, this is the here we have the corresponding payoffs. Yeah, as we increase from low from low correlation to high correlation, given we are in the group of of of, of stocks that have low volatility. Okay, what we see is an in, a decrease of the payoffs. Yeah. So we see that the payoff decreases as the volatility increases. So we see here a negative correlation between the payoffs and the increase in volatility. Yeah. Exactly the opposite. So in a negative correlation. Yeah. So then what we see in panel C, we see the corresponding three-factor alpha. So the risk-adjusted payoff, you know, the alpha, the regression intercept, after regressing the, the payoffs on the three-factor model. I was wondering when I saw this table, why don't they use the six-factor model? 
the or the five factor model here they only use the three factor model but what we see is basically the same pattern here okay so as we move from from low given each group of volatility as we move from low correlation to high correlation the risk adjusted three factor alpha is decreasing a trading strategy that is buying high correlation stocks and selling low, low correlation stocks for each of these irrespective of, of, of which volatility group we have so the payoff is negative yeah, and significantly negative for all groups and it's the same pattern as we have, have seen for, for the cap m the payoffs are decreasing as we move from low to high volatility yeah? so there's a negative correlation between the, the payoffs as we move from low to high volatility so next in in table three they const they construct basically what you see here betting against the beta as uh, betting against beta as betting against correlation and, and volatility so they regress the betting against the beta factor yeah from their 2014 study on the betting against the correlation factor and betting against the volatility factor yeah and what they and what they see here is that the uh, that both payoffs here yeah 0.69 and 0.58 are both significant because the statistic of 60 and 63 yeah, suggests significance on any level. Yeah? The R squared, so both factors here, they explain 85% of the variation of the betting against the beta factor in the US sample. Yeah? So, and of course, this must be like this, this must hold, because obviously, if we scroll back now in the in our paper, so the 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 beta is a function of the correlation and the volatility so it 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 must be like that so and what we see is so if we consider now the uh, first hypothesis they argue that the betting against the correlation factor should generate a positive alpha yeah um and this would basically uh, favor the theory of leverage con constraints uh, and what we see here is if we construct now the, the the factor it would be basically the the average what we see in in, in table three and uh, in, in table two sorry it would be the average obviously of these guys here uh, the equal weighted average of these five groups would be the the betting against the correlation factor yeah and what we see is irrespective of which volatility group we are yeah this this, this spread is negative and obviously um according to the theory we would implement the strategy the other way around right so they report here what they report here is this is this trading strategy that buys high correlation stocks and sells uh, low correlation stocks for each of these volatility groups right now that's that, that's the payoff here yeah the risk just a payoff so according to the theory if you want to test the theory it would be the other way around okay this would be positive 0.3 because you would implement a, a trading strategy that buys low correlation stocks and sells high collection stocks for each of these five groups yeah so the payoffs here would be then if you would test the theory you you would test uh, 0.3 and 0.3 you would basically test you, you could test either for each of these groups or you can test the average yeah so and you see irrespective of which group of volatility we are the payoffs are significant so from table two, we can already verify, um, or this table two supports the theory of leverage constraints. Okay, this is what we learn from table two. So let's now 
move on. We have already discussed table three, so this is redundant basically. Let's go to the next table, uh, table four. So they also, if you go through the table, through, uh, through the paper, they basically do not further um, report the results uh, of the betting against the volatility factor. So it's basically, as far as I've understood, in the appendix. Instead, what they focus on is uh, in table four. Let me just see. In table four, what they do here is they, uh, again, they use the, the betting against the correlation factor and uh, they report uh, robustness check here. So from, from again, from table two, we can basically already confirm or yeah, we can confirm that uh, the the outcome here um, con uh, supports leverage constraints. Yeah, because we would obviously implement it in a in a different way. The training we, we we should take the the uh, um, we we would Im implement the trading strategy the other way around. We would basically, if we want to test leverage constraints, we would buy low volatility stocks and sell high uh, sorry correlation stocks and sell. Uh, low uh, high correlation stocks. So we would buy low correlation stocks and sell high correlation stocks. So this would be positive 0.3. This would be also positive 0.3. So the spread would be something in between 0.6 or some or or something like that. Now remember here. So the time period of table two, we use stocks from 1929 to 2015. So the point estimate that they report here is slightly different. Yeah? So the average should be, according to the other table, it would be something like 0 0.6. Yeah? But here we have 0 0.82 yeah? as, as the uh, betting against the correlation factor. Yeah? And why is that? Obviously, it's because they use a different sample. Here, yeah, the sample period is from 63 until 2015. So again, this table four is also about the betting against the correlation factor. It's it is it's uh, what they what they do here is a robustness check. So they use equal weighted portfolios. Yeah, this is basically the the, the equal weighted average of this group here. Yeah, but yeah, the the positive return of that, and then the equal weighted average across these five groups, given this sample period from 63 to 2015, yeah, what you would get then is obviously 0.82. And here they, they do a regression for each of these volatility quintiles here. They regress it and they report here in, in, the, in the first row the simple excess return and the corresponding T statistic, yeah, and the corresponding Parma and French five-factor alpha. So, the, so they regress each portfolio here yeah, the zero cost strategy yeah, that is long on on low low correlation stocks and short on high correlation stocks. Yeah, given each volatility quintile, they regress it on the Farman French five factor model. And here, what you see here in this row are the corresponding payoffs, and below that, the corresponding T statistics. So, for each of these group, we see that the payoffs are significant even after controlling for the Farman French five factor model. Let's just consider now the uh, overall factor. Yeah, here in the, in the last column, they regress the uh, average factor, yeah, which is the average, obviously, of these five groups, the equal weighted average. They regress it on the Farm and French five factor model. The alpha is 0 0.6, so which is the regression intercept, and um, it's highly significant. Yeah, the T statistic is 5.25, and that's per month so it's a monthly estimate again so what we what we learned from from this column here is that the strategy is obviously uncorrelated with the market factor yeah the point estimate against the market factor is minus 0 0.04 but the t statistic is uh, within minus 1.96 and below yeah 1.96 so it's minus 1.05 indicating uh, that it's not significant on a five percent level However, the size factor, yeah, the loading against the size factor or the beta against the size factor is 0.63. Uh, 
yeah, with a TS statistic of 16.2, indicating significance on any level. What does that mean? So that means that this betting against the correlation factor, so low low beta stocks, tend to be obviously um, small stocks, yeah, because this factor here, the zero cost strategy, is exposed to small stocks. Yeah. Moreover, it is exposed to value stocks. Yeah. The point estimate uh, against the, the, the HML factor, which is the value factor, is 0.17, is positive, and the tier statistic of 3.1 indicates that this point estimate is significant on any level. Moreover, the point estimates against the profitability factor or the investment factor are not, are not significant, yeah, which is indicated by the uh, T values of minus 0.4 and 1.0. Yeah? They are below or they are within the interval of minus 1.96 and 1.96, uh, and so they are statistically not different from zero. So what does that mean? So again, the betting against the correlation fact factor uh, has 0.6% per month risk-adjusted return after controlling for the Farman French five-factor model. It's not exposed to market risk, not exposed to profit, not exposed to the profit profitability factor or the investment factor, but is exposed to small stocks and value stocks. And as they argue in their paper, this is also uh, what they expect. This is what they write in section 3.3. That is now again um, important. So the betting, let me just take this away. This was the wrong button, so I have to push this one. So the betting against the correlation factor as a positive loading on the value factor consistent with the theory of leverage constraints. Indeed, the theory of leverage constraints predicts that safe stocks, those with low correlation and volatility, become cheap because they are abundant by leverage constraint investors giving rise to a positive HML loading. So that is the economic explanation for the empirical finding that we have seen here in table four. Let's now go to the next section entitled uh, idiosyncratic risk. Okay, now we are talking, or now we are interested in the uh, SMAX factor. This is basically reported in table five. Let's move on to table five, yeah, where they report doubles, double sorts on max and volatility. Yeah, so the table is entitled Scaled Maximum Return S Max versus Volatility. Yeah, risk adjusted returns. So again, they do uh, they have 25 portfolios, yeah, so they sort on the S Max, yeah, five into five groups from lowest to highest. So again, we have quintiles, yeah. In this quintile here, we have stocks that have the uh, lowest S max um, and here in the in group five we have th those stocks that had in the previous months uh, the highest S max and here on the uh, in, in this row yeah, we have those stocks that have the lowest volatility and here we have those stocks that have the highest volatility so we have a double sorting again yeah? So, what, what we see here is that stocks that have a low S max in the previous months and that are in the lowest volatility quintile generate a payoff of 0 0.4 per month. Now, this is 4 is 5.4. Whereas stocks that have the lowest volatility but the highest S max they generate an excess, well, they generate um, returns of 0 0.1, but they are not significant, yeah? Because the T-statistic suggests that this payoff here is not significant, not different from zero. If we construct now a trading strategy, yeah, given we are now in 
this group of, of stocks that have a low volatility in P, for P1, we implement a trading strategy just for P1, where we are long on stocks that have a high S max and short stocks that have a low S max. This trading strategy would give us an average return of minus 0.3% per month with a T statistic of minus 3.4. Uh, again, indicating significance on any level. And now we can imp implement it at the same trading strategy for each of these volatility qu uh, quintiles. Uh, we can always implement the strategy, uh, giving, given now we are in, in volatility group uh, P1, uh, we can implement again a, a, um, a trading strategy that is uh, long on stocks that have a high S max and short stocks that have a low S max in the previous months. So this strategy would generate a return of minus 0.5 with a tier statistic of minus 5.1. Yeah, and we can do this for for each of these volatility groups. Yeah, if we do this for the highest volatility group and would implement this trading strategy, we would have a payoff of minus 1.2 percent per month, which is enormous, obviously. And the statistic indicates that this payoff is significant on any level. So what we see is, irrespective of uh, what is the volatility, yeah, we can always implement it in a trading strategy that generates significant payoffs. Here in panel B, they report the corresponding three-factor alphas for this strategy. And what we see here is the same patterns. Yeah, so they are almost almost the same. Yeah, only here the last one is is a little bit higher than here for the simple uh, excess returns or for the or for the simple cap cap M alpha. Yeah, so they report the, the the cap M alpha. Here they report the alpha of the three factor model. Yeah, but it's basically the same the same uh, pattern. What we also see is an increase. Yeah. So as we move from low volatility to high volatility, we see that the payoffs here linearly decrease. Yeah, they decrease linearly in volatility. The same pattern here for the three-factor alpha. It's the same pattern. So again, if they would test the uh, theory of uh, lottery demand or lot um, lottery-like behavior so what they would do is they would test the other way around okay they would buy stocks that have a low s max and they would sell stocks that have a high s max so then again this return would be positive 0.3 with a tier statistic of three for positive 3.3.4 yeah so all of these basically confirms also the second claim, yeah? so that that the second component of the BAB, the BAV, yeah? proxied here by this by this S max here, obviously delivers uh, alphas that are positive, yeah? because you would obviously implement if you would test it again if you would test the theory. You would basically do it the other way around. You would, for each volatility group, you would implement a trading strategy that is long the low group here, the low S max group, and sell the high S max group. Yeah. So again, all of these point estimates would be then positive, and taking the average of of these groups here would be basically your your risk factor or your your S max factor. Yeah. The equal weighted average of, of these groups. So then what they do then here in uh, what follows, yeah, so they 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 testing in, in section five the, the underlying economic drivers that's not so important for, for, for our purposes. So the, the the first five tables are those tables that uh, I would like have to discuss with you here in this lecture yeah so if we can if we then go to, to to the conclusion part yeah
let's go to the conclusions. So how do they contribute with, with their study? So they present new evidence here. Yeah. So they present new evidence consistent specifically with the theory of leverage constraints by showing that low correlation stocks have high risk adjusted returns that cannot be explained by other low risk factors. And they uh, confirm it both in the US and internationally. So their, their betting against the correlation factors produces significant six factor alphas that is close to orthogonal to other low risk factors. Yeah. So, and that's basically the, the most important finding of their study here. Yeah, thank you for your attention.